Uh, when I first started at the booth uh, three years ago at this point, I was cl quickly introduced to Graham uh, Hobart's work, not only from our executive director, Seth Hopkins, but also by John Mariana. Uh, Graham's photograph, Fog of War, we've talked about it today, perhaps you've seen it as well, hung in the galleries, uh, was entering the permanent collection at that time, and I had the chance to learn more about him. Uh, after many phone calls and a few visits to the museum, Graham and I were able to create an exhibit that can do justice to his career and vision. At least I hope it does. Uh, I'm excited that I now get to be a part of this next section where Graham will be able to share more about his past and future uh, as an artist. Uh, thank you all and thank you Graham for being here very much. Uh, and we'll start with a brief uh, little video and uh, from there we'll go. Thank you.
Uh, so hi, Graham. How are you doing? I hope today has been going well for you. It's a wonderful day, and it's a crescendo of a climax on top of a wonderful 10 years of work. But, but uh, it's not over, but this is definitely a significant moment. Good, good. That's great. Uh, so I guess we can start with some of the lovely, easy but hard questions. You know, where are you from? Can you tell us a little bit about your past? Yeah, and just in case you don't know this, um, I don't know the questions that are going to be asked here. Um, and so what I did is I, I just kind of came up with a bunch of pictures <laughs> that I've assembled into folders. Uh, so if you're wondering what the format is, I, I'm hoping this will work out. I've never done this before, but mm. hopefully what we can do is Sam will ask me a question, and then I'll try and be profound. <laughs> And if I can be profound while at the same time searching for an image to support the answer on the screen, mm. we'll try and pull it, pick it up. But this could be an int interesting adventure to see if I'm actually able to pull it off, sounding profound and put, picking, up, picking up some uh, visuals to support it. So, mm. so let's see what you have to, what you have to ask. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, you're the whole exhibit, so out of Africa and into the West, so you're uh, were lived and raised in Africa, and that had a sort of a profound impact, I imagine. So, what was it? What was a little of your background like? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so those who weren't here for this morning, I'm going to let you know uh, pictorially just a little bit as I describe my um, my biography. So, let's see here. Um, so if, if there's any indicator of what a person's going to look like when they get old, short, fat, and bald is not a bad start. Um, let's see if, oh, I've got to hit play, don't I? Sorry. <laughs> I've never done this before. Here we go. Um, <laughs> and um, I grew up to be a naughty little boy and full of mischief and judging by how much dirt is on my school uniform there, I was pretty active. Uh, unfortunately, I spent a portion of my childhood in, I wouldn't say an orphanage, because they call them children's homes, but basically a, a place where parents didn't want their children or couldn't cope with their children any longer, and I, I spent the most important and most formative years of my life, uh, that little guy there, as, uh, as a child who was well aware that his, his parents lived but had no interest in being around me. And as a teenager, um, there was a war raging, so getting out into the, um, the wild was problematic. But because I was in Africa, there was a fair amount of wildlife coming to the neighborhoods. And here I am with the Scots owl. And I think this is the last picture here. No, it's not. Um, I started traveling, uh, but as just did it in any way I could. And if you ever know what uh, the Mini, you know, everybody thinks of the Mini as a popular car. This is the original Mini. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to climb up a mountain with boulders as big as the wheels. So, uh, and I overheated on this mountain. But I was trying. Uh, another way I, I preferred to travel around Africa was uh, on my bicycle. So, um, so I started traveling for usually weeks at a time at the beginning. And that grew to months. <laughs> and kept going. Now here I am in my early 20s traveling through the Congo on my bicycle. And uh, just because I'm a photographer, I'm very sensitive to copyright, uh, I'm going to give credit to the person who took this picture. <laughs> <laughs> now Daniel was my interpreter in 1983. And I would like Daniel to stand up and be recognized. Now, Daniel, just turn around and look at them, and let me put the next picture up so they can see that I'm not the only one who aged here. Because <laughs> that's Daniel down at the bottom of the picture there on a canoe. With, uh, with a Graham cap on it. Yeah, that's my cap. You gave me that hat. Oh, did I give it to you? Yes. OK. Well, I'm glad. Anyway, so that, that I'm just so honored to have Daniel here today. Um, but uh, Daniel and I traveled quite extensively through very, very wild parts of Africa. And when I came to the end of that phase of my life, because I had to leave Africa, uh, suffering from the effects of malaria, and not Africa, leave the Congo, suffering from the effects of malaria, uh, I was actually about to leave Africa, not realizing 
that upon my departure from Daniel, I had been granted a scholarship to attend college in the States. So, um, so there was only a matter of weeks before, between seeing um, Daniel on his canoe, and a few weeks later, I was in, in the United States studying. And uh, in between, in those two, a couple of weeks, I borrowed a camera because I decided that I wanted to start recording some of these amazing experiences that I was having, and, and I borrowed this old Helena. Um, and here is an example of a picture I took um, on the very first roll of black white film I ever photographed, uh, one of 10 frames. And uh, that was the beginning of what has now become a 36 year career. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think uh, there's more, <laughs> but I think that's enough detail for now. So, what, would, what was your artistic inspirations uh, as a child? Like, were you always into photography? Did you know that's what you wanted to do? Did you experiment with painting or drawing or anything along those lines? Yeah, so interesting question. No, I never aspired to being a photographer until that moment that I borrowed that, um, uh, that, that little Helena I had just shown you there. Um, up until then, I had wanted to be an artist, but my parents had banned me from ever studying art. They, my father said, I will not have a bum for a child. You will get a real education. And so I studied industrial chemistry, organic chemistry, and physics uh, into college years. And, um, and it was only when I picked up that camera and I started taking pictures like that, that uh, gateway you just saw that I really started falling in love. It was with photography, it was instant. Uh, prior to that, like when I was 10 years old, I would travel out into the remote areas where black people lived because they were segre segregated from the white people. And I would sit at the feet of the black natives and I would carve stone uh, starting when I was 10. And, um, and so I was more of a sculptor than mm. any other art. But I also continued on from carving stone to oil painting and uh, illustrating and pen and ink, and, and also by the time I was in high school, I was already casting bronze sculptures. So, so I was I really saw myself as a sculptor more than anything else. But that picking up that camera and seeing the magic of a uh, negative being developed and the magic of a print being developed in the darkroom and the in that red light uh, was trans life transforming. Uh, it captivated my imagination, and I have never been the same since. Although I have continued to shoot. Uh, to illustrate and even sculpt into my adult years, uh, the love of photography has been a constant all the way through. So when you lived in Africa, and was there any sort of, in, did it have an, in, you were talking about wandering and exploring and, and having that little chance before you got to, got malaria and, and had to uh, transition out, but did that aspect of exploration have an impact into what you saw in terms of what you wanted to create uh, visually, or? Hmm. Um, I really think that the, the creative process of expression mm. is secondary to the internal process of discovery. Mm. And so the goal was not to become an artist, but the goal was to experience life. Um, the outside is mostly the need to express oneself <laughs> with a little <laughs> touch of, I've got to pay for this somehow. Mm, mm. Um, and keep in mind uh, that anyone who buys my work is funding my next trip. Mm. So, so, um, so there's no shame in me turning, I feel no sh and I feel no shame in, in turning my expression into an income because without the latter, mm. I'm not going to go very far. And so I had to, to it, get that balance. But at the core, of what came first was the adventurer. Mm. What came second was the need to express. Mm. And what came third, out of necessity, is the need to make a business out of it. Does that make no, sense? No, that makes perfect sense yeah. and really gets to the core of the reality of, of making art and, and living as an artist as well. Mm. So that was, thank, thank you for that. In fact, you know, this isn't the first time you've been featured in an exhibit at the booth. Uh, you were in uh, Artistic Photography Today in 2019, uh, but that wasn't even your first time at the booth. So how did you come to know our, our humble little museum? 
<laughs> yeah, uh, we have a lot to thank uh, John Mariana, if you can stand John. And uh, beside John is Lynn. But John was actually my first contact with the booth. Uh, I think it was 2013. Uh, I had just been on the heels. Actually, I think I still had an exhibit in London with the National Geographic Society. Um, so around that time, I was also speaking for Nikon cameras. And I was at an exposition giving a lecture on the topic was finding your, your, your visual voice. And, and Nikon really didn't want me to show any of my recent work, which I just started, which is infrared. But, it, but capitulated saying, all right, you can talk about infrared photography as long as you start with your current, your, your color work, which I was actually well known for. Uh, in fact, uh, why don't we see if this is a good time to pull that up. I'm just going to zip through a couple of color pictures, because there was a life before infrared. Uh, all right, here we go. So this is before what I do now. I was a pretty good looking guy when I started. <laughs> and immediately upon going into commercial work in my 20s, I was already ambitious and turned my attention to trying to come up with a way of photographing that no one had ever done before. And I invented this thing called photographic cutaway. And I don't know if you remember back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, it was very popular for famous racing cars to be featured, featured as um, airbrushed cutaway posters. Do you, Chad, is there anyone old enough to remember that? One person. <laughs> so it was, it was a very popular genre, genre for auto mechanics to put posters of racing cars on there. Well, it's kind of, I don't know if you've seen, you've probably haven't seen that, mm -hmm. have you? No. Anyway, I was the only person in the world who could do this. Photographically, in a camera and a darkroom, produce images that sometimes were 450 exposures layered mm -hmm. on a single piece of film. And here's another one. Uh, you know, the previous one was hard cuts. Sec uh, there's a lot of soft masking here. Mm -hmm. And here's another one of a cutaway of a light meter. And here's another one of a racing motorcycle. And uh, there was stuff there. Th that was the early work. And then, and that was all done on film. Later on, I moved my attention to more, uh, of, to, to digital. I was one of the pioneers in digital photography. Back in the mid-90s, I was already shooting digital cameras on a commercial level. So here's some of the architecture. and. You know, shooting for min window manufacturers and hotel chains and builders and and institutions and hotels. Anyway, a lot of commercial work. That's what I was known for, and uh, and so I'm now giving a lecture, having to fulfill my obligation of showing this work, <laughs> and and then sneaking in a quick peek uh, at the end of my lecture about my infrared. And right at that moment, I can't see you now. There he is. John walked past and said. What am I looking at? I thought I'm a, at a photo exposition. Turns out that uh, he was captivated by my infrared photography and asked me to speak. That was followed by, um, uh, sorry, I did come and speak eight years ago at the Guild. And uh, Seth Hopkins, uh, who snuck in trying to make sure that the Guild was getting its money's worth out of the invited speaker, um, came up to me afterwards saying he was impressed and would like to have, well, he just said, come and have breakfast with me in the morning. So I had breakfast with him, and, and he challenged me, saying, um, based on what I saw you do last night, uh, I would like to challenge you to go out and photograph the West like you did Africa. And, and that was followed two and a half years later by, uh, I think it was actually more four years later, um, I can't remember the exact date now, where uh, finally uh, they accepted a, a piece of work that uh, met the challenge to the standards of the booth. And that's now been acquired by the museum as part of the permanent collection. And if you haven't heard about it, it's the two bison headbutting called Fog of War Bison Rut. And is that where the idea for the exhibit sort of started then? Yeah. So again, he invited me to have lunch this time, not breakfast. But, <laughs> but I have now learned that Different meals, here's yeah. a hint. If Seth invites you to a meal, <laughs> it's probably got something important associated with it. So, so he, he then, upon delivery of that image, said, I'd like you to come and have lunch with me. And uh, at lunch, he said, it looks like you can do this. So now that you've done this, we are opening up a new wing, camera wing, and we're going to start taking photography seriously. I challenge you to go out and do enough of this quality of work that we can actually hold an exhibition. 
And so it took another several mm. years. And that's where you can make the picture. <laughs> and, and perhaps we can have you finish the story. Oh, right. Well, uh, I guess in that sense. Uh, so uh, like I said in my introduction, uh, I joined the booth almost three years to the day, very, very soon, actually, in August. And the first thing that uh, was brought up was future ex exhibition plans. And your name was mentioned. And we were also uh, dealing with this new uh, acquisition that I needed to learn about and find more about the artist. And so I did my research. And then we started talking, um, emails and phone calls. You were able to visit at one point. We were able to see the work printed. And Actually, I think that was something really When you really first great. entered the, I had not passed the grade yet. Mm -mm. It was still yet to be determined whether I would be granted an exhibition. So I had to still prove myself. But we were in the process mm. of me being good enough uh, mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, it took a lot of convincing. I and think it was yeah. a year and a half before yeah. I saw the... So from the, the time power. that the acquisition happened mm. to, yes, you can have the exhibition, I had to do a lot of earning. Yeah, and that was about four years, I think, to, from, from the acquisition. The, uh, four years from the acquisition, yeah. yeah. It, I just remember it being... <laughs> For you, it's a different thing, I imagine. Seth did not make it easy, mm. and he did not give me any... He said, and that's why I say this, because he says, I'm not doing any favors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, there was a little bit of growing to do. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say I wasn't ready for this exhibition 10 years ago. Uh, it's not just in terms of I didn't have enough pieces, but I had a bit of proving to do and growing to do as an artist. So, um, so it was a good process. When you were when you were challenged to go out west and try and do what you've done in Africa with the Western subjects in your style, uh, did you was that the first time you had shot in the West, or have you done so before? Had it wasn't the first time I'd been in the West, right. but it, <laughs> yeah. uh, because I, I did several trips with my children as they were growing up. But um, but yeah, it, I was unfamiliar with mm. the West as an artist, and and as I yet. And as I discovered after that, I was completely unprepared to shoot the West. Mm. I thought, based on my experience in Africa, that it was just a matter of adjustment, mm. but it was more like a, it was like more like a, I don't know. Being it was it was a very destructive process to my ego, a very humbling process, and a very enlightening process that took over two years to go from what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I've made this promise to Seth, and I haven't got a clue to um, well, you know, start off saying, yeah, I can do this, to I haven't got a clue what I'm doing, to I think I'm mean, hang on, this was a multi-year process. So what was the difficulty, or what was the challenge? There we go. What was the challenge of, of transitioning between those two uh, yeah. subjects? Or well, I think, the, I think the obvious thing is that I was unfamiliar with things like snow mm. and glacial, um, gl glacial valleys and, and the the tectonic and geographic aspects of the West uh, that that were so different from Africa, um, I knew it would be different, and I was intrigued and excited about the idea because I always dreamed about really exploring Africa as a child. I'm uh, sorry, exploring America as a child in Africa. Um, what I was unprepared for, which I alluded to in the the last uh, the little walkthrough, was um, just how the the colors of the American West compared to the colors in Africa, didn't translate. Mm. And, and the crisis was that was I ever going to be able to make sense of it, uh, the red, green, blue aspect we talked about earlier. Um, because the challenge was to shoot America like I did in Africa. And, and, and Seth even challenged me along the way. He says, I thought we were going to look like that. <laughs> and I had to write him a long email explaining mm. to him the whole process. And, and he got it, and he says, I accept your answer, to proceed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I remember, I remember some of those conversations, especially uh, early on, uh, at least my early on. Uh, and that was one of the big things was the, while you have, like, especially for those who were at the gallery walk or prior, you could see some of the more uh, etching-like ones, the ones that seem uh, very bright and crisp. And you even have a, a sort of stylized way of even talking about them, right, with uh, out of obscurity and in search of, in white. Search of white, yes. Mm. Yeah. Is there a question in there? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying if you're asking for validation, I think you got it right. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. good, good, good. Uh, but no, with, uh, in search of white, that was, I mean, started chronologically was that, and that was bringing out the whites of the paper. And really, I think what you said at the gallery walk was very interesting and, and good for any artist, regardless of the medium, which is 
how, how do you communicate what you need to with the least amount of information? Um, what, is the, um, what is the point in which you have it? And I think those ones capture that quite well. But as we've discussed and as we've had to explore, the West required different approaches. Mm. Yeah, and, and just something that just came to my mind, it's unrelated to anything we said so far today, but, um, but I think it's a good time to bring it up. Uh, in extrapolating uh, or, or bringing up the essence uh, requires something that photographers have to do, which is much easier for illustrators, which is to, to extract unnecessary information, mm. to bring a story to its essence because the world comes at you from so different angles and there's so much information being fed to your eyes. Uh, good art requires separating the, the noise from the, from the message. And, uh, and some of it's just easy, you just crop. You've got telephone poles here, you've mm. got a, a, you know, a speed limit sign there, and you've got this pretty scene. You can just simply crop it so that you don't see the, the, the noise. But, um, but then there's a thing in such a way that requires that you start pulling out information and removing information that's not helping your message. And, um, and so I think there's a little bit that we haven't mm. said about that aspect, which is, is there's a clarity to that in search of white that really is because it comes down to the essence of, of just what's necessary. Mm. Yeah. And I like that mention of it. It's an active process. If I, it's very sculptural, now that I'm thinking about it. And that makes sense considering uh, your background, because it is this sort of subtractive process of okay. removing those layers to get to the heart of the piece of what truly is within that mm. that material. But sure. now it's two dimensional instead of you know stone. And the tough thing is that before you take the first chip of stone off, mm. you've got to know where you're going. Mm. You can, uh, you, or you start over. I mean, there's always the chance of creating a new block of stone and starting over, but, but, um, but you don't start chipping away until you have an idea what you're looking for. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is a, a mental preparation that leads up to the beginning of the processing. So you've got to know where you're going. And uh, you can't go wandering around saying, oh, let's just try this and try that, because before you know it, you corrupt the image and it just falls flat, or you just corrupt it so much that there's not enough information to really hold it together. It might look OK on your Facebook page of the size, or even on an 8x10 or a number 14 on your wall, but when you're starting to go 20 by 30 or upwards, uh, the integrity of the image falls apart. Mm -hmm. So having purpose philosophically, artistically, artistic expression-wise, and um, and technically, knowing that you're going to a destination and you're going to take as few steps toward that destination to avoid corrupting it um, mm. means that you're really starting to split this from that, saying you're discarded, you're needed, you're important, you're not, and, and just through cropping and, and uh, separating gray tones from whites and saying this gray tone, you're going to go white, and this gray tone, oh, I need you black, and, and making all these little tiny micro decisions is more of a mental process that's takes place long before you actually open the file and start working on it. Thank you. With the, that just made me th want to ask why this process in particular, why infrared? I don't want to reduce it to the medium because it's so much more than that because that's just one of the many steps that you take to create your mm -hmm. final image. But why did you start there? Why, why not yeah. do something else ent entirely? So my last lecture here to the Guild ended on that question, mm. which is, how did I get to here? And, and I went through the whole process of how I started as a commercial photographer working in color. And, um, and, and the agonizing, painful process of, of desperately trying to actually have an individual look that was, it was not associated with any other living person, living or dead, so any other person, living or dead, that I could call this mine. Mm. And, um, and so the look, which we were, I won't put a picture up there because you've already seen it. <laughs> the unique look, it had to be something that just hadn't been done before. I was turning 50 years old and I just had a career of just taking and, and, and cashing checks for pretty pictures that helped other people. But the, leg the true legacy was, the truth of my legacy was that most of my work was being discarded in the trash can within seconds of being observed by the viewer. They say, oh, that's a pretty picture, and then they just throw it away. 
Um, occasionally, I would do something monumental. It may go up for six months, but then it would never be seen again. Um, what I was looking for was a legacy that would outlast my lifetime. And, and so the look was not so much that it had to look like this mm -hmm. at the beginning, because I didn't know it was going to look like this. What was really important at the beginning is that it was going to be like nothing had ever been done like it before. And so I had to experiment and go through a journey of looking for that look. And so when I found something that I could call my own, I latched onto it. And it just so happened, it also happened to look pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm glad I discovered it and I've stuck with it. So was it a process of just experimenting with different techniques and styles and mediums? Yeah, uh, the moment of truth came at 3 o'clock in the morning. I oh. sleep very well, and I never wake up in the middle of the night. Not for any reason. I just I close my eyes, and until I've had my eight or nine hours sleep, I don't wake up. But one night, I just bolted up wide awake, and I said, I got it. <laughs> and, I, and I said to myself, I just dreamed the look I want. And, mm. and, and so I just, I was still in my pajamas, and I rushed to my computer, turned it on, and I pulled up the first image. It just happened. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I am sure I'll find it while I'm telling the story. <laughs> um, yeah, it'll probably be in here. So uh, I will play it as soon as I get to the, the point. So, so I, I, I knew I had cracked the look I wanted, and I ran to the computer, opened the file, and I started working on it. And then I, I realized I had no idea mm. what I had dreamt. I, I had a visual in my head. But, but as I started examining the visual I had in my head, it wasn't visual at all. It was just a feeling. But I was so sure it was a look. And then I started trying to somehow work the image, and I realized I have no idea about anything but a feeling. And then that is what I'm asking you to see is the feeling, because the way it looks is actually processing the feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's all I really happened. That was the point of, uh, of that was when it clicked, is when mm -hmm. I realized I don't have a look, I actually have a feeling. And every picture is an expression of that feeling, or the feeling I had to express. And so for those of you who know about computers and, and photography, there are artists who sell what they call presets, where if you push this button, the computer will rework that image to a set of instructions, and it'll have spit out a look. And in my mind, I kept thinking like, yeah, there's going to be a preset for this <laughs> that I can push and mm -hmm. have a look. But in actual truth, it, there was no preset. And even the ones I saved on my own didn't translate to not even the next image, let alone three of the next five images. There wasn't a, a repeatable um, process. There was only a feeling to chase. And so every one of these pictures is really just chasing a feeling. Mm. And the aha moment was not saying, oh, I've discovered the look that nobody else has. It was the discovery that I have a unique feeling mm. that I know how to express, and this is how it turns out when I express it. And is that too abstract? <laughs> or does it, does it make sense? Does it actually make sense that the way it looks is not a mm. technique, it's actually a feeling expressed? Mm. And with that... And this is the picture, yeah. by the way. Okay. That's the first one. Mm. Storybook. Storybook illustration. So what, was, what, did you, what, did, what did you wind up changing about it? Well, the, you're talking about the, the last iteration or the, from the original? Uh, what was like from that iteration? Uh, so, so this one's gone through several life cycles, but... Um, but the original, the, the raw file it came from was just mush. I'm telling you, just <laughs> that's all you can say about it. There was no black and there was no white. And it was just all these vague notions. I'll, I'll show you another, let's see if I can find another um, example of what mush looks like. Because <laughs> it's true, we have the pleasure of seeing what uh, it is at the end of the process, where we don't actually get to see what, uh, we don't get to see the block of clay, as it were. Yeah, so here's uh, one, another early picture here. And this is not total mush like some of the others, uh, because you wouldn't even recognize what you're looking at. But if I was to um, show you this. So, so oh, I'm going to hit the button. So this is what a raw infrared image comes out of the camera looking like. 
you can recognize it as a as an elephant, but sometimes mm -hmm. you look at it and say, "What did I shoot there?" And you have to really look and say, "Oh, I can see something." Uh, but still, you can see that there's no hard black, there's no hard white, and it's muted. And uh, and so so that's a raw image, and that's what a raw image looks like converted to black and white. And then from there you process it out. You you can you're about to see it, but before you see it, I'll tell you that I took the tones in the background and lightened them up, and took the tones in his wrinkles and crisped them up, and and took the foreground and turned it into what looked like pen, pen and ink. But here it comes. Can you see mm. just how it's forced and manipulated and massaged and 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 not quite hammered to the point of breaking point, but just pushing it pretty much to the edge of what the, 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 the digital file is capable of holding without falling to pieces. If you've ever worked with clay and made a clay pot and you work it too long and the whole thing just flops, mm -hmm. and you say, oh man, and then you literally have to throw it away or mix it in with other clay because it's useless. You can't just like rebuild it up. Um, you can do the same thing with a digital image. So, so really starting with a rich, vibrant, um, healthy, raw image uh, can go a long way to um, to, to working and pushing and, and working very hard to an end. And, and the end here was, if you look at those plants in the foreground, they literally have a black outline around them like they were drawn in pen and ink. And, and, the, and the background is separated uh, out. Uh, anyway, so I don't, that's a, once, once again, infrared, the big thing with infrared is that it takes greens and it turns them white. And it's, it's nothing magical about the infrared making it look like this. This is, the, the infrared is only the, the, the foundation mm -hmm. to start with, and the, uh, the finished look is more of a process of expression than it is a technical, technicality. Mm. And when it comes to expressing I, and the emotional impact, it is related a little bit to the stylization, um, and, and I don't want to say nostalgia, but like this view towards the past as well. Cause I, I've mentioned it several times, other people have as well, that they have this sort of quality of like lithographs and from the Victorian era as well. Is, was that intentional? Yes, it's actually by design. Um, because I grew up in like children's homes and, and impoverished areas, all the books that I ever looked at were black ink on cheap paper that had faded brown. And so my early story books uh, were black ink on, on cheap paper, but they took me to other worlds. You know, they, they took my imagination into other worlds. And so, and they were old enough to be near Victorian age anyway. So, <laughs> uh, so and also as I traveled, uh, I remember seeing in various places and museums the work of Thomas Baines and other early explorers who um, would often go on scientific expeditions with, with uh, scientists and biologists and botanists. They would take along, because cameras went around, they would take along artists who would then record these fantastic sites and, and animals and everything and go back to Europe with their sketches and create elaborate lithographs that would then be put into scientific journals showing the outside world in all its glory and fascinate and captivate the imaginations of all the people uh, back in Europe. And so those, those lithographs and those etchings of the, uh, of the early masters were a, a large inspiration for me to go out and shoot again to revisit that era when man hadn't destroyed everything and say, okay, now that we've got the feeling again, mm. then, the challenge, then the challenge is to then say, okay, now that I've reminded you that the world was a beautiful place, untouched and unspoiled, how about we just try and return a little bit of that back to them? Um, and so I use the Victorian lithographic feel as a purposeful tool to, to provoke and to inspire and to, um, I'm not encouraged, I, I'm trying to use something more forceful than courage, mm. to challenge someone to go out there and, and actively stop the, stop the, the destruction. Because one thing that I enjoyed about working with you on this is this level of precision that you're demonstrating right now, both in thought, but also execution and messaging. And I remember you having have a conversation over the phone about even the frames themselves and how they look. And I know we mentioned it in the gallery walk, but I'd just like you to mention it again, just in case anyone's missed it. Yeah, uh, I searched long and hard for the frame design, and these are imported from Italy, or well, the framing molding comes from Italy. The frames came from me. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was looking for something that would hearken to an, an era older than 
contemporary photography. And, and when I saw these, this frame molding, I said, that's charred wood. Charred wood ex exudes the sense of scorched earth mentality. And what we did to Africa and, and America in the West was scorched earth mentality. It was, we want this, it belongs to us, and anything in the way will move or be destroyed. And, uh, and this is what we ended up with. So, so it's charred wood mixed with that metallic sense of coal and, and the industrial age uh, is a kind of a reminder of man's hand or fingerprint on that world. Yeah. And so that's the, the feeling of, a, the, of, oh, this is beautiful. This is amazing. Framed Where it, is it? It's, the work is framed in this context of of destruction, mm. you know, it's beauty contained by in in in, in a frame of what have we done? Yeah. Wow, wow, and even then the textures work together as well. So yeah, again, that multi-leveled yeah. way of approaching natural it. subject, natural mm -hmm. border. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know the details of these are amazing. Like I, I think I've mentioned it to you many times and other people as well here that uh, as I was examining them when they came in, I would I would go into the darks and go, oh oh, what's this? It's a hair. Like, you've pulled this single strand out of this complete, what I originally thought was utter darkness. But in fact, the more I looked at it, the more the details sort of came out. So I imagine because of that, these can be quint printed quite large. Yeah, uh, most of what you saw that was this wide can be tripled. It can mm -hmm. be 12 feet. Well, uh, 12 feet is a good, healthy one. I mean, maybe beyond that. I mean, the reason it can go beyond that is because the bigger they get, the further back you have to stand. And then all of a sudden, you're looking at a billboard, but, <laughs> but you have to stand 60 feet back. But mm -hmm. if you're putting your nose up against it, yeah, a lot of those can go 12 feet wide and still show more than what you see now because there's detail that's not being expressed. It's just too much for those prints, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have more room. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's true. With I've, I have a few more questions uh, before we ask the audience um, if, you, if you have any questions. So this is your warning. Think. Um, I expect at least one. Uh, with your commercial career, though, do you th has, has it informed your work as a fine art photographer? Do you think it has helped in some way or, or challenged you and others? From a technical point of view, being an accomplished photographer um, with good equipment, I think, really helped. Mm -hmm. um, I did not have to learn photography and how to be an artist. I just mm -hmm. had to learn how to be an artist. I did not have to learn about the animals and how to use the camera, which is very often the case with safaris. You go out there and, um, and, and you've got the situation in front of you with animals leaping and bouncing, and then you've got other animals standing stationary, you've got other things, like the trees and stuff that are moving. And, and if you're not if your camera's not an extension of your arm, mm -hmm. and it's so familiar that you just like, can just go into action, you can't concentrate on your image if you have any thought for your camera. And, um, and so in that respect, it, it's absolutely uh, wonderful that I already had a solid career in photography. Um, also, growing up and having once experienced the wild meant that I was somewhat familiar with um, the risks involved and how to stay out of trouble. Um, I, I mean, I had a lot more to learn, uh, somewhat naive. Um, I think I got, I've been lucky not being <laughs> bitten by more snakes or, or, or chased by more elephants. Um, more? <laughs> because, um, because I had some encounters, you know, uh, when I used to ride my bicycle out there. I mean, I remember what it was like to feel uh, you know, elephant charging. But, um, but going back, I, I, um, I still had to do a fair amount of more research because first-hand knowledge is just what you know. There's a lot more that you don't know that you can learn from others and, and inform your pictures. So, so second time around as an adult with a camera, um, it's good that I knew the camera well enough that I could just concentrate on the, the animals and the, and the expression. But I'm trying to figure out if there was something else I wanted to say. Um, oh, the, how the commercial lends itself. So, Yes, so there are many, many aspects um, like perspective control and um, depth of field control and um, uh, clarity 
and scaling, because I used to photograph for, for trade show booths, so the pictures had to be big, and, and all of these technical aspects, uh, all of that knowledge transferred over on a technical level from the commercial. And so it wasn't just like, oh, I knew how to use a camera. I knew how to use a camera for scale, for clarity, for messaging, but I was in, a, I was in the color world. Mm. Mm. And I was trying to please a client, not myself. Oh, so that's, a, that's very different. Very different. Very different. Uh, and the engagement's quite different, yeah. Well, actually, we're thinking about, you know, you as an artist, what, is there any future projects or current projects you're working on? What can we look forward to? Well, this is not an announcement. <laughs> um, but um, there's got to be a next step. I mean, artists don't do well when they say, oh, I've arrived, or look at mm. how much I've accomplished, I can relax. Um, I don't want to be known for one genre. Um, I don't even want to be known as a wildlife photographer. Um, mm. I want to be known as, as a person who explored the earth and expressed himself. So, but along the way, I'm constantly trying things. Um, I want to do my art on natural objects, like feathers or leather, or in this case, I'm going to show you. Um, this is on wood. Oop, I didn't hit the button properly. Try again. Did it work? Yeah, it did. OK. Um, this is my hand touching a piece of Baltic birch where I laser etched the image into wood with an industrial laser cutter that normally cuts sheet metal <laughs> into, <laughs> into, into plates, you know, like, uh, you know, just flat metal. But I, I thought of this guy, he said, yeah, this has a variable beam laser. I said, what do you mean variable beam? He says, well, as it moves, it can go brighter and darker. I said, what? Well, and, 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 and so I said, but it does a path, doesn't it? He says, yeah, it cuts, it cuts a path. I said, well, can it do, can it do scanning, like all the you know, line burns, uh, line upon line scans, um, as in rasterized images? Yeah, yeah, I've never done it before, but yeah, it probably can. I said, well, let's start trying. And, <laughs> and, and six, uh, sorry, uh, two and a half years later, we had programmed that, that thing that normally cuts out sheets of steel wow. into something that looks quite three-dimensional as it burns the wood the laser beam um, chars the wood black mm -hmm. and also digs down into the wood. And then we've got where the less intense heat of the beam hits the wood, it can boil the sap and bring it out as browns. And then oh. where, where it only warms the wood, it can actually ooze the sap in a sepia tone to the surface. And when you don't have a laser beam, you've got raw wood. And so, um, so these are some of the things I'm experimenting with. Anyway, if you look at the bottom of the picture there, the bark, I mean, you can touch that bark mm -hmm. and it, it feels like a tree. It just absolutely feels like a tree. So that's one thing. Um, another thing I'm thinking about is staying in the natural world, but, um, but maybe more vegetation. Uh, one project I, ha I have in my mind right now, in fact, uh, one of our guests here, hey, uh, Gary, and I have been talking about exploring the be most beautiful trees in America. Uh, like post oaks with mm. Spanish moss hanging and stuff like that, uh, and doing kind of a southern tour of trees. So, um, so those are some of the thoughts filtering through my head. I think the important thing is that um, I don't want to be known for this mm. body of work. I want this to be known as my wildlife photography phase. Mm. Um, and I'll probably continue to shoot, shoot photography and add to my collection, but I'm going to add other other genres as I go forward. Well, where can we can we f where should we find you, like in terms of following you on social medias, or you know, can people collect this work or your future works, and where would they go about to do that? I have used the controversy over Facebook spying on everybody <laughs> as a perfect excuse for me to drop out. In reality, I really don't like that world, mm. and so when I dropped out for security reasons, it was so liberating turning into one of these hermits that just disappear off into the jungle or into the bush or into the wilderness and just check out. Mm. Uh, I've been doing that for 10 years and <laughs> I love it. And <laughs> I am now going to have to re-engage with society. <laughs> so if you look at my Facebook page under Graham Hobart or In a Different Light is another way to go, 
Um, you will find me, the question is, will you find me updating you? Hopefully, I'm going to re-engage the society and start talking about my journey again. But um, I, I have to confess I've been neglecting it. But, but um, if you email me and sub start subscribing, that will put pressure on me to answer back with, so, <laughs> with, uh, with content. Um, I, with every year I've gone quiet, I've got less people asking. And so it's been a nice little cooperative, I don't talk to you, you don't talk to me. <laughs> but if you start talking to me, you, I will engage again, and I will start informing the future of what the next project is. Is that a deal? Yeah. <laughs> and you have your website as well, so you yeah, have it dedicated. Yeah, grandhobab.com. Um, maybe I can pull it up. No, it doesn't matter. Grandhobab.com. Um, just put a brand new website up. And the only thing on the website under fine art is this exhibition. <laughs> um, because this is a debut exhibition, and my website is a debut website. I, I threw away the old one, and I just put this new website up. And if you look at the fine art, the only work you'll see is what you see here. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go home and say, what was that picture again? Go to my website. It's, um, it, it, it'll be this, this, this exhibition. And then as time goes on, I'll add some of the other pictures as well. Um, well, let's ask a question here. Uh, what do you think someone who shoots like I do should be looking to next time? What do you, what do you think? I know you're a wonderful photographer of human beings, but I'd love to see you photograph them the way you have animals and landscapes, with that, with that emotion that is so present in all mm. of your work. It's interesting. I've been photographing nudes for 10 years. I don't know if that's the same thing you're thinking about, but but in an effort to try and connect with humanity, not just animals, I've been quietly shooting nudes in infrared for 10 years now. Um, but I'm a bit, sh a bit shy. <laughs> 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 Maybe one day I'll have the courage to come yet again to the guild and show the nudes. I don't know. But, but it's a very intimate journey of my own that it was not meant to be a book. It was just a personal journey mm. of, of shooting nudes uh, in infrared. Um, I may continue that until I have something worthy of, of a public um, or, uh, exhibition. Uh, and you said just humanity in general, like portraits of people? Yeah, I was just so, I was so struck by the emotion of, of your work. You know, uh, seeing it, you know, I've seen something on my phone or something on the Facebook page, but seeing it in person was just so emotional. Mm. Well, I think that may say a lot about who you are and the empathy you feel uh, that you connect with what little I have of my connection with human. It might be a, a blend of both of us, where I offer what I have, and then you add what you have to that. And, it, and if, with your powerful uh, empathy, you perhaps make it into something more than I did. Well, thank you. I don't think I can take credit. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will I, I'll take that into consideration and see just how good I am, yeah. yeah. Any other genres I should explore? Specifically, what? Well, just the, the wilderness, the kangaroos, the wallabies, and hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, it, it does sound good. Uh, Australia has a lot of similar colors to the West, so now that I think I've got the West under control. Let's see how much of that translates to Australia. Because <laughs> they've got, like, yeah, the, the leaves are different. Like, their eucalyptus leaves is more of a teal than a green, so it'd be interesting because teal's got blue in it, so I wonder what that would do. Yeah. Yes. Now nah, you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Buy one of my pieces of work, and, you, and it'll, it'll pay for my trip. <laughs> <laughs> you take me. OK. Um, sounds good. Yes? Yeah, I think that's a, a worthy um, thing to think about in the future. Uh, I've seen another person by the name of Nick Brandt do the same thing, starting off with the beauty of Africa and then turning his attention to the destruction of Africa. And I think he did a wonderful job. And, and I think uh, it's, it's a worthy cause. But, um, and I'm not making an excuse. I'm taking up the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I say it's worthy to, 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 to challenge me. But, um, but speaking up until now, the goal was to bring nostalgia, not horror, you know, mm -hmm. nostalgia in a positive way to create a certain feeling that would first get the reaction saying, wow, this is beautiful, then the horror of 
oh, what am I doing? What am I doing to destroy this? I don't want to lose this feeling. Mm. And uh, so I try to keep it on a positive level at this point. But uh, quietly, I'm also in the background shooting things. Like I remember sh catching poachers out in... Oh, wow. Not catching them personally, but finding <laughs> them uh, in Lake Manyara area of Tanzania and capturing them and reporting them to the, to the rangers. So, so I, I am using the camera as a documentation, but I, but I don't show that work. But I did document them. Are there any questions as we uh, reach towards the end of today? I have to see. Sir. Oh, yes, John. I mean, there's always a possibility, <laughs> as what I would say. Uh, yes, we are always looking into different ways in which we can uh, have traveling exhibits in, in, our, in both our other Western uh, siblings, uh, uh, institutions, but also elsewhere as well, as we're starting to see even more museums uh, pop up, like in Florida as well. Mm. Yes. I think that as people contact me and demand, um, I, I will revisit that. Um, I just sold one a few months ago, and it, it was a success. I mean, it was, it was a good amount of money, and, and the person felt very good about it. And it, I took that as a lot of encouragement, so maybe I should revisit that. Uh, and if you are personally interested in that, uh, have you got my card? Okay, uh, come to me after this, give a cut, and then we'll start dialogue just to see how realistic it is to set up an industry for that, because the laser machine itself was $200,000, so I'm going to have to rely on a corporate cooperation, um, uh, but, but it can be achieved if there's a demand. So let's see if there's enough interest. Uh, that's why I brought it up, because I'm, I'm looking for interest. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of research. <laughs> I'd like to see if I can cash in on it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But thank you for the question. I, I, I'm glad that you asked because it shows me this, this hope. I thought I saw more hands. Yes. When I was intrigued when you stated that uh, your early commercial photography was with Fujifilm. Yes. And you said that you had the I wouldn't say more complicated. This is a lot easier than what I used to do when I was in the 20s. <laughs> um, uh, did you, I mean, I'm not trying to challenge you here, but did you see the color work I just put up? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that was my early work. Did you have a comment on what you thought about my early work? I'll put it up again if you want. I see what you're saying. Yeah, uh, I actually, I lost, I got divorced, and my ex-wife had the portfolio. So, so not all of my early work um, survived. But, but I have, through luck, um, a lot of those 11 by 14 negatives. I mean, big oh, wow. negatives and 8 by 10 negatives and 4 by 5 negatives. I do have a stash of those that I've, uh, that I've stored and kept and. Um, and documented because I always knew when I was in my early twenties. <laughs> I always knew. <laughs> I still think I always knew that I'm going to be famous one day. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty ambitious, and uh, and one day those are going to be important. <laughs> does that does that encourage you that I did try? I, I have a lot of my early films still, but it, most of the film I still have is film I did for myself. For the clients, they get the film. You know, I, mm. I'd hand them the film and they give me the check. So I don't have a lot of that work. But, but the personal work, I do have a lot of it. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have a special story behind one of your photos that you have shown today? 
do you want a funny story? <laughs> or a scary What's story? your genre? I'll pull up a story. Let's see if I can find one here. A story. Okay, I'll tell you two stories. So we'll start. Well, um, what's the one story? Okay, so that would be Animal Encounters. <laughs> Seems appropriately named. Here's a nice, pretty picture that you might like. Uh, <laughs> and here's a wonderful encounter I've already described of me looking over my shoulder and seeing a bear standing, a big bear. I mean, it's a big grizzly standing up, looking at me just sort of a few feet away. Not a few feet, it's more like 20, uh, 20 yards away. Let's not exaggerate here. 20 feet is pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny because I actually go back to the moment in my mind. I mean, I remember just like staring at him, and I actually feel the sensation every time I go back. Uh, this guy here, this is a recent one. Um, this is a really good-looking elk, and, and I was wa walking through the mountains in Colorado at 11,000 feet, right where the, sh if you look at just how short the trees are around them, they're only like five feet high. and. Um, and I was tracking two elk. One was bugling really close, and one was bugling way off in the distance. And I, I could hear the echo changing between the two distances. And I said, I'm going to go chase these guys. Maybe I'll get a good picture. And I tracked them for a, a long enough that I was completely out of breath at that altitude, carrying my big camera. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I came around this tree, and there he was looking at me. And I put the tripod down and took the shot. And we had a freeze in time, um, free, uh, we, the moment frozen time where it was just the two of us, man to man. <laughs> but what I did not know is that he was, he was not happy with me. And right after this moment, he charged me. Ooh. And, um, and so we've got, I think it was 25 to 30 yards between us. And he dumped his head down, and he came right at me. And in between us was nothing but grass this tall, and this spindly little spruce <laughs> that was like five feet four inches tall and about that wide at the top. And uh, and all I could do was run at him. So I took my tripod and I put it up in the air so that my camera was like ten feet up in the air. And not ten, but maybe nine feet in the air, and I ran at him, and then ducked into this behind this tree. <laughs> and of course, I'm taller than the tree. <laughs> and there's this guy; his nose is so close, I could touch his nostrils right there through the tree. And all he would do, and he was just like doing this and looking up and doing this. And every time he dipped that top of his antler down, I knew that the antlers would go right past me. <laughs> you know what mm. I mean? He was that close. And he was going to skewer me. I was sure of it the way he looked at me. And then there was a snap of a twig behind me. This was the second one. I had passed the first one. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I'm in between this guy, who's really upset with me, and another guy behind, but the thing is that the other guy behind was terrified of this guy. And so I watched his eye go up and down to me, up to him, because the other guy's up the hill slope. I mean, he's like, I think he was like three or four yards behind me. He's behind another little tree. I didn't even notice him. So he's just not like how far. He's from here to the end of the screen away, tucked away in the bushes, trying to stay still. And, and I actually watched this, this guy looking at me, looking at him, looking at him, and finally, he looked at him and then just took off. <laughs> <laughs> and right. I said, but, you know, it may not be a bear, it may not be a lion, but I sure was as scared as anything I've ever been. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so is there another story in there? I'll tell you one more story. Uh, let's see. Um, Might be in here. Uh, I'm close. I'm close. Close. Is this one just as terrifying in the No, <laughs> the it's end. a different story. How much insurance do you pay for? <laughs> I do not insure my cameras because I break them quite a lot. 
I have a collection of broken cameras. No, I, it's cheaper just to buy new cameras than to fight the insurance companies. Um, all right, I'm close. Or am I already putting this up? I forget that. <laughs> and while I'm looking this up, could I have Lindsay cue the Ambicelli video, please? Here we go. This was from my last lecture. Oh, it's ho oh, no, it's not. I don't have the story in pictorial form. Um, sorry, I thought I had it, but and I may have it somewhere else, but I'm not going to waste any more time looking. I'll tell you the story of the, the one that the booth uh, has acquired, which is the, um, it started off looking like this. Um, it started looking like this. Is that right? Yeah, uh, a raw a raw file, and and I'll just quickly show you how I developed this picture. But no, I'm not even going to show you. I'm just going to get out. I'll just tell you the story. So this is earlier on. This is the very first week, practically almost the first day, uh, within a day or so of me arriving in Yellowstone to begin my um, journey of making this, putting this exhibition together, or, or getting the first piece to the booth. Uh, the camera I had. It had to be calibrated to the lens, one particular lens. Each camera had its own lens calibrated so I could look through the viewfinder and expect what my eye saw could also be in focus in the infrared. But the problem is that something, for complicated reasons, I changed the lenses to a lens that did not belong on this, uh, on this camera. But I knew this little trick, which is if you just put a, a loop, a, a close-up magnifying loop, stacked onto the back of the camera, you could turn the, the LCD preview screen on the back of the camera, and you could let the camera focus off the, the CCD itself. And you could see it on the screen, and if you just kind of hold your eye up to the, the loop against the camera, you could use it kind of like a viewfinder. And so I was kind of doing a lazy man's way of quick focusing with this, uh, with this loop. And, but I also knew when you took the picture, the camera had to process the picture, and during that type of processing, the LCD screen turns off, and you see, see nothing. So in effect, you take the picture, and then you go blind. And if you take more than one picture, then you go blind for a while. And if you, ta if you keep shooting until the camera's memory cache is full, you go blind for about 30 seconds, where the, you can't see through the viewfinder, and you can't see through the, um, can't see through the LCD screen either. Uh, and, and this encounter, where I was photographing a bull and its cow, was suddenly interrupted by another bull charging up the hill. And I remember them coming right at me. And I'm standing there with a 17 millimeter lens. Now, normally, I shoot 600 or even 1,200 millimeters. So a 17 millimeter lens is a fairly wide angle lens compared to my normal work. And I was pretty close to the animals. So to know that I went from a cow and a bull just eating grass to two bulls fighting from here to the second row, uh, maybe the fourth row in front of me, it was a terrifying moment. And furthermore, I knew that once I took the first shot, I was blind. Mm. So I made the commitment to turn, hold the, the camera down so I could do multiple shots and just hold it down. So what I did is I, I composed the very first shot, I took it, and I held the trigger down and fired. 16 shots. On the 16th shot, the camera stopped. The LCD, of course, shut off immediately after <laughs> the first shot, and the camera went dark. And all I could hear was the sound of the shutter and the two of them going at it with dust and hair torn and horns clicking and bones cracking. And it was just a horrific sound. And all I could do was just follow the action with my eyes closed because this eyes is against the camera, so I can't see anything. So I literally just closed my eyes and I followed the sounds while photographing blind. And so I want you to imagine the feeling mm. of when the camera shut down, and all I can do is pull the camera down and watch the fight, knowing there's nothing I can do with the camera except watch the fight unfold. And then, when the fight was over, look down and look at the LCD and quickly scan to see if I got anything out of it. Well, the picture that's now part of the museum's collection is the last shot before the camera oh, shut wow, down. Oh, wow, yeah. Awesome. How's that for a story? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, thank you, Graham, for uh, being here today and answering all these questions. Uh, shall, we, shall we treat them with a little? We should treat them with that, uh, our last little video, yeah. It's only like 45 seconds long, I think. Uh, Lindsay, if you want to queue up um, 
that Amboseli um, video, is she? I can't see her. Here we go. I think she's going to do it. Uh, I'm going to shut my computer. And, um, anyway, and while she's queuing up, you, you can, uh, I'll leave you to, say, to, to end it. <laughs> well, uh, like I was saying, thank you for being here. Uh, it has been great to have an artist here for the full day and have so much of their work and process shared. I think everyone, I hope everyone, got a little bit of something out of this, both the technical but also that artistic side, and then also the story. Um, and we, and if people are interested in acquiring your work, because this is, the, what's upstairs is your private collection, uh, they should just go to your website and reach out, I imagine. Yeah, this is, the work I have done earlier on, I, my last website, you could just buy the prints online. And even now, technically, you could buy the prints online. But I think I'm in a stage of my career where I really want you to reach out to me and discuss the possibility of collecting my work. Uh, this body of work is the beginning of a long legacy. And I, I would encourage you to think about more than just a pretty picture, but, but becoming a collector and, and acquirer. For those of you who just want to casually buy my work, this is a pretty picture. That will come soon. I'm going to do an open edition where mm -hmm. I, I have a number of yeah. lesser known pictures. But right now I'm looking for um, a follower of collectors and admirers of my work who really want to invest in my career because I'm a living artist. I'm not a famous dead artist. <laughs> so, so when you say, I want to own that, what you're also saying is, I want to invest in his future. Mm -hmm. And so please reach out to me, take my card today, consider uh, the work as a personal investment. Uh, speaking for those who've bought my work in the past, I promise you it's worth more now um, <laughs> than it used to be. Uh, and, and so for investors, from an investment point of view, I think it's just a good time to, to, to buy my work. But I think more importantly than acquiring my work from an investment point of view, you would be a acquire my work to further the cause. Mm. And it's not just keeping me alive, it's, it's, it's furthering the work I do, which will come to an end when I run out of money. So, <laughs> so, so you are, by acquiring my work, doing mm. yourself a favor and doing the world a favor. Mm. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess we have our, our, our little video.